Peggy. No, it was, yeah. Well, it's always good to be able to sing to, to God. I mean, I can hear you guys singing when we're doing our regular congressional singing, and it's pretty to hear it up here because it echoes off, and uh, it's a, a joy to hear that. And I know that, that God delights in our praise, uh, whether it's a C sharp or a B flat. Um, Or both. <laughs> I've not yet heard that chord. I like to. <laughs> you know, when we first get introduced to somebody, uh, we kind of do some small talk back and forth. And eventually the conversation gets to the point where you ask that person that you're being introduced to, well, what do you do for a living? And you tell them, this is what I do for a living. And, and then that person feels almost obliged to ask you that same question. Well, what do you do for a living? And it seems kind of strange that a lot of times we, as people, we identify ourselves with what we do uh, for a living. And that thought came to my mind. Wouldn't it be nice? This is just a side thought that just came to me this morning. Wouldn't it be nice if we identified ourselves uh, with God, first off, and identify ourselves as Christians rather than what we do for a living or what we do or whatever and it comes to that. But that's just a kind of a sideline I was thinking about. But you know, we're in this topic dealing with what angels uh, are as far as among us, and, and today we're looking at what are uh, angels' duties or what do they do, so it kind of falls in line with that question, what do you do? You know, last week we discovered that angels are indeed among us. And that's what the uh, screens up here are talking about, angels among us. And if you look real close at that screen, you see a bunch of people doing their normal every duty days. But kind of in a fade, you see an angel off to one corner there. Um, but you notice that in that angel's uh, presence, there's no reflection in the water below. There's another angel running right next to the other people running. Uh, but once again, you don't see that reflection in the water. So it's kind of an interesting uh, slide that shows that angels are among us. I mean, we discovered that last week. But today's message and what we're going to be looking at today is the question, what do angels do? Because if we realize that angels are among us, then the logical next question would be, well, what do they do? And the other question I have, when we look at that title as far as what do angels do, here's one key question. It says, if you knew what angels do, would that enable you to be more attentive to how they're working in your life? And what is an angel's purpose? That's the second question. Why did God even create them? Did he need them? I don't know if he needed them or not. But he did create them before he even, as we found out last week, before he even created the earth, he created angels. And he didn't just create one or two or three Z's. The number of angels that were created are innumerable. And so this is something we're going to be looking at as far as what do they really do? And in the Bibles, go ahead and turn to your Bibles and turn to uh, Hebrews 1.14. And we're going to be looking at three areas uh, really built upon what we're going to look at in Hebrews 1.14. We're going to be looking at three areas, three topics that we're going to concentrate on. One is angels in service to God, which we're going to find mainly in Psalms 103.20. Uh, and then we're going to look at angels in, uh, as their service to mankind, which is going to be mainly in Psalms 34.7. And then... I'm going to twist it a little bit, and what was brought to me when I was going through the, the sermon here was that, what can angels not do? And that's an interesting question, because we always think that angels can do this and that and everything and all that, and, and that may well be true. But here comes the question, what can they not do? And we're going to see that as the last topic before we uh, conclude and go into invitation. So is everybody on the same train to China here with me know where we're going? It's up on the screen. It's also in your bulletin. There's a part there dealing with Pastor's Corner that I left some space in there on purpose so you can add notes if you want. 
So we have various different ways. And you can go ahead and in your Bibles, turn to those pages, at least have them bookmarked or, or tagged. So let's look at Hebrews 1.14. We know that in Hebrews, the first seven chapters primarily talk and they kind of concentrate on angels. And if you were to study and read all the way through chapter 1 and go into 7, you're going to see a smattering of verses and passages that involve angels. But one thing in particular is in Hebrews 1.14. And this speaks primarily to what they do. And this is a question that came out from the writer of Hebrews. And it said here in 14, 114, it says, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? It's a simple, basic question, but it was a question that came to mind at the time of writing Hebrews. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? So that's our basis of our message today, is that particular uh, passage, that verse, 114. So how do angels serve God? What's the purpose for angels up in heaven? What do you think? You're right. It's to praise, glorify, and obey God in all ways and every way and all the time. If you turn to Psalms 103, verses 20 through 22, it speaks also of what they do. And I'm going to go ahead and turn to that, and you can turn it with me. In Psalms 103, verses 20 through 22, it says this, and you can follow along with me. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in this dominion. So when I read those verses, if you paid attention to what we were reading and what you did read yourself, what came out quite a bit? What word stirred out? You're right, it's praise. Praise came out all the time. Praise the Lord, you his angels. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts. Praise the Lord, all his works. Praise came out. So with that said, what that drives us to look at is that the one main thing that angels do for God up in heaven is praise him. You know, God doesn't need the angel's praise. He doesn't even need our praise, does he? <laughs> you know, but the thing is so beautiful about that is that he delights in our praise even more so than he delights in the praise of the angels, the multitude of angels up there in heaven praising him. He delights more so in our praise to him. And you think, well, that's got to be awful hard, Pastor Ed, to sit there and talk about praising God. I mean, gee... My life's all about me, what I do, what I can do, what I will do, and what I have done. I mean, that's all about me. How can I praise God? It's real easy. Matter of fact, let's do a little, let's do a little exercise. Just go ahead and bow your head and say a quick prayer of praise to God. And when you praise God, what you do when you praise Him is that you acknowledge something special about God. So go ahead and do that. Bow your head. Say one quick sentence to yourself. About God, I praise you for your love. God, I praise you for your majesty. God, I praise you for your holiness. These are all characteristics. And as you praise God right now, when you're doing that, what's happening? You can, you can get done. You can, yeah. But when you praise God, what happened? What was unique about that particular time? Were you thinking of yourself? Were you thinking of the roast in the oven right now? Were you thinking about what I'm going to have for lunch? What's my week going to be like? No, when you were at that point in time, praising God and just acknowledging what he was, it took your eyes and thoughts off yourself and brought it on to where it should always belong in the first place, on your Lord, on our Lord, on our God. For he deserves all praise and honor and 
glory, much like the angels, because that's what the angels primarily do and are assigned to do up in heaven, is to praise him. And we, as his children, should be a very common, easy thing to do, to praise him. So that's what we're looking at when it comes to praise. What's important to know that is that angels praise God continually. That's key to know. It's not just a momentary thing that we just did just now. That was just a moment where we spent maybe about 30 seconds in praise. But you know, the angels praise him continually. All the time. We see it in Revelations 5, 11 through 12, where they're all gathered around his throne. Multitudes of them are gathered around in his throne. And back in, in the very back of your Bibles in Revelations 5, 11 through 12, it talks about that. And I, I like what the angels say there. Here it is in, in, Roman, in, in Revelation 5, 11. It says, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand and they encircled the throne and, and the living creatures and the elders. And in a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. These are angelic beings. And there they were taking their eyes and their thoughts off of their own selves and said this, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And what that means there, if you're going to want to praise God, read that verse. If you have trouble figuring out what to say about God, read that verse. You know, this is God's love letter to us, Scripture. And I, I tell this to you guys every week is that if you want to discover where you're supposed to go, what you're supposed to do, where you've been, where you are going to be, it's all right here. There's no guessing when you go into Scripture. And if you're having trouble determining what I'm going to say to God, how I'm going to pray, what it means to praise God, it's simply right here. And what I invite you to do is in your quiet time this week, go into Psalms. Just go into Psalms and read two or three psalms. Just try it. See what it does for you. Because psalms is part where you look at praising God. It's all mainly about that, with the exception of Psalms 51, where David repents. But all the other psalms, you're going to see it deals with praising God. And then if you really want to be wise, you flip over another book and you're in Proverbs. There's no mistake on how this was written. How God inspired men to write what's in here in his love letter to us. But if you're not in scriptures, you're not in God. How can you love God and say you love God if you don't read his love letter to you? Angels glorify God. They witness and they show what he does and what he will do. When Christ was born in Bethlehem, what happened there? A multitude of angels came there to the, to the shepherds and said, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men whom he is well pleased. That was in Luke 2.14, where you saw the angels come forth and declare and proclaim and glorify God for what happened at that point in time. And then like what we read earlier during prayer time, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents which is in Luke 15, 10. There they are glorifying God at the same time. I've always said to everybody here that the purest form of worship you would think would be singing songs, which we've done today, or praying to God. You might assume that that's the purest form of worship. But you know, if you really want to worship God, if you really want to worship Him, if you want to worship him, the best way to do it in the purest form of that is to be obedient to where he is leading you according to his will and not your own. It's when you are sitting there in line and in plumb with what he has you to do. That's the purest form of worship. That's where you are guided along the way where you're supposed to be. Now the angels, the angelic beings up in heaven, they 
also obey God. The ones who don't obey God, guess where they went? They went to Hades. Sure, hell. Because they rebelled. They did not obey God. They felt that they themselves were God. One such being Lucifer, who became Satan once he rebelled. Because he wanted to be God. He did not want to fall in line or obey the God who created him. Sometimes I wonder what he was thinking. But the thing is, is that it's not too far removed from a lot of us sometimes. For when we sin, it's at that point in time where we rebel and that we do not seem to want to obey or worship God but worship something that we feel we need to do or want to do or have to do to please ourselves. But you know, the, the joy that we have and the comfort that we have as children of God is that by being a child of God, if you just come and ask for forgiveness, he forgives us of our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. You see that promise in 1 John 1, 9. And so this is a very important part when we look at it when it comes to obeying God. If the angels did it, we by golly should be doing the same thing. Now, how do angels serve mankind? That's an interesting question. Well, you know, God's name is Yahweh Sabaoth. It's one of, the, one of his uh, names is Yahweh Sabaoth. And Sabaoth is translated in Greek as God of the angels. It is God who controls our lives, and in do so, he has the power to utilize the talents of the angels that he's created to do his bidding. His angels are sent to deliver messages, to execute his judgments. And we've seen that in Sodom and Gomorrah. We also saw his judgments also in the Passover. And in the assignment, other, than, uh, other assignments that God might deem necessary. But the angels are there. In the Bible, when we look at Scripture, we can see stories upon stories upon stories. If you really want to do a concerted study on angels, you see that the angels constantly deliver messages. They accompany the lonely. They grant protection and even fight God's own battles for us in his stead. Next week, we're going to be looking at the main key question, do I have a guardian angel? Some of you might wonder, wonder about that. And that was laid on my heart that I need to go ahead and talk about what a guardian angel really is. Or do we have angels? Because I don't have just a particular clearance myself, I'm sure. There's probably a bunch of them that have to be guarding over this little guy. But, you know, the thing is, is that we're going to look at that. But God does send angels to watch over us. And what's interesting is that when the angels come, they are so majestic and angelic and awe-inspiring. If they do appear in bodily form to us, what's well, one of the first things those angels have to say to us poor humans? Do not be afraid. Do not fear, as if that would be probably the first thing I'd want to know, too, if an angel came poang right here in front of me. I'd go, ooh. And he would say, do not be afraid, Ed. And I'd go, okay, what's next? <laughs> but most of the time, however, God's angels operate under cover. They don't uh, draw attention to themselves. They carry out their assignment given to them, God, pretty much so quietly. You know, one thing I saw when I was studying this is that never when angels appeared to man has man ever asked for an angel to appear to them. Man's never sought after an angel. They never sought after an angel. The only time an angel really did any type of work is through the direction of God himself. And in their duties, they obeyed God and did what God told them to do. Angels are actively involved in the lives of people, and maybe even people that aren't saved. You kind of wonder about that sometimes. But they're actively involved with people based on what God wants. They have a specific function, and God blesses us when he sends an angel in response to our prayers or in time of need. You ever think about that? And sometimes you might not even realize that an angel is actually working for you. But that's where you have to have the spiritual eyes attentive to what it says. Because see, in Psalms 34, 7, 
You can turn to that, to that verse too. Psalms 34, 7 talks about the key thing dealing with when it comes to ministering to us as, as people. And this is something that you can use when you want to be comforted. You look at Psalms 34, 7, it says, well, I'll, I'll, you know me, I go one verse and one verse past. So look at Psalms 37, 6, first off. And it says this, this poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. It sounds like us quite a bit. And in verse 7, here's the key verse in verse 7 of, 30, of Psalm 30, 34. It says, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. What does that mean when an angel encamps around you? That means that he is right there. You might not see him, but he's encamped. He's steadfast. He's right there with you. When I set camp, when I was in the army, we set up a, a, a position, and we had to fortify it, work on it, make it better every day we were around that certain position. We were encamped. We were there for the long haul. And it says there in Verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, that's fear God, and he delivers them, that's God delivering those who fear him. And that's a joy, that's a peace knowing as a, as a child of God that he watches us, he watches over us, that being God. He attends to our needs, our wants. Amen. Now when it comes to angels, there's two things, I call them the double M's. They minister and they provide messages when it comes to us as mankind. They minister to us at God's bidding. And you kind of can see that. And in your quiet time, go ahead and look at the story of Elijah. What happened to Elijah? He was running away from who? Ahab and Jezebel. Because he did a number on their prophets. And so Elijah said, I got to get out of town. I got to leave. I'm um, and he was out running away from these people as if he needed to really run away from Jezebel and Ahab. But he was. And he felt depressed. He said, God, take me. Kill me. I don't want to be here anymore. And did God send the angel down there to slay Elijah? No. What did that angel do when he ministered to Elijah? You see it. In 1 Kings 19, verses 5 through 7, it's where Elijah was underneath the tree and the angel fed him and nourished him, gave him strength, encouraged him. Isn't that a beautiful thing? God knew that Elijah needed that pick-me-up. Much like us. Because we go through life and there's times, I'll guarantee you, there's times in our lives where we're discouraged and we're tired and we're saying, I don't know what I am doing and you come to God in prayer and say, help me. And he will. God will help you. God answers you. He hears you. He is near you. And you see it in the Bible all the time. If you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. We see it in Jeremiah all the time. So that's one of the things that the angels will minister in that regard. You know... You think about it. Jesus was man on earth. God, man on earth. Incarnate, they call it. God incarnate. What an amazing thing. But you know, when Jesus was down here, he was in human form. And he got tired. He got hungry. He was tempted. Ooh, that's different. You mean my Lord was tempted? You mean Satan thought he could get his way with my Lord? Yeah. Satan was that prideful and that greedy. He thought he could actually manipulate Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's an amazing thing to think about. But you know, in the wilderness, Jesus fought off Satan with Scripture. That's why it's so important to be grounded in Scripture. He fought off with Scripture. And you see in Mark 1.13, after he fasted and worked and was out there in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, the angel was sent down to minister to Jesus even and comfort him. And then in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was praying, praying to the point and being anguished to the point where he was sweating drops of blood and saying, Father, let this cup pass from me 
who came and showed up. There was an angel there to minister to our Lord at his time when he was sweating drops of blood in anguish. I don't know how many of us in this room have ever sweated drops of blood, anguished over something that you don't want to do. But I do know that in this room, people have gone through times when they need to have God stand beside them and show them and comfort them and bring them along the way because God has a plan for each one of us as we see in Jeremiah and that we should be attentive to where God is leading us, being in his will all the time, knowing that as, as we follow his will, he will attend to us in ways that we don't even know to accomplish what will he has set us into and that path that he has us on. He will not abandon us. Our Lord will not leave us alone. Our Lord will never, ever leave us in the dark. And he will always be beside us, whether it be through an angel helping us out without us even knowing it, or by just direct intervention that we see as we read God's word. This is our light right here. If we're walking along a, death, a dark path, right here's my lantern. Look at Psalms 119, talks all about that lamp to my feet. Uh, that's why I always emphasize God's word. He rescued Peter from prison. Peter was chained between two sleeping Roman guards in Acts 12, 5 through 10. That's a neat story. That's kind of the story we're going to see next week when, the, when Peter knocked on the door and the followers, the disciples, thought that that was Peter's angel coming to set them free or let them know what's going on with Peter, but it was actually Peter himself. And so you saw how the angels ministered there. And then they're messaging angels. This is the neat part about what they do. They're messaging angels. The announcement to Mary from Gabriel. Gabriel's one of the archangels. And we're going to see later on that there are various different casts or statuses of angels. There are archangels. Michael and Gabriel, the two key archangels. But Gabriel was the main messaging angel. He's the one that spoke to Joseph. He's the one that also messaged and announced Christ's birth to Mary. When, so when, when Abraham and Sarah were given the news that they were going to be given birth to Isaac, it was three guys, Jesus himself, along with two angels, that announced that to Abraham and Sarah. And then later on, those two angels went and told Lot there in Sodom and Gomorrah, get out of here. And so you see where the angels even messaged and helped and gave news at that point in time. And then I think the most beautiful announcement the angels ever did to mankind was at the resurrection. And you see it in three of the four Gospels where that the angel or angels were there when Mary and Martha showed up. And we see that story in, in Matthew 28, 2 through 7, and Mark 16, 4 through 7, and then even further in, in Luke 24, 2 through 8. It talks about those angels being there and saying, why are you looking at this empty tomb? Didn't you know? Didn't you hear that he is risen? And it was those angels that sit there and blinded and knocked those Roman soldiers to the point where they didn't know what was even going on. So when you think about that, you think, well, these angels are pretty cool. <laughs> pretty powerful dudes. And they are. But you know there's certain things. This is the last thing we're going to be looking at. Because what we looked at is how, God men, how angels minister to God. We looked at how angels minister to mankind. And now we're going to look at some of the restrictions. What can an angel not do? And you're thinking, well, Ed, that's a silly question. Angels can do everything they want to do. They can come through the walls there. They can, I mean, I, I can't walk through that wall. It'd be a mess. Not only to me, but to that wall. But, you know, angels can do what they can do based on how God directs them. But here's a couple things. There's a man named Dr. Jack Graham. I don't know if he's related to Billy or not, but there's a guy named Jack Graham. He's a pastor at Prestonwood Baptist up in Plano. And he wrote a big article about what angels can and cannot do. And he emphasizes one main fact. And he says, this, he says there's at least one critical thing angels cannot and will not do, which is to witness to the saving grace of Jesus in their own lives. Let me say that again. 
Angels cannot witness to the saving grace in their own lives. They can't be saved. Because they're created by God with no sin involved, unless they rebelled. But they can't say to somebody that's not here on earth, well, God saved me. But we can. And that's what separates us from angels. We can witness to those that are lost of the saving grace of God in our own lives, which the angels cannot do. Interesting fact. Angels testify to the glory and creation of God, but God has called us to witness. In Acts 5, 19-20, the apostles were put into a prison, pretty much so, and separated, and they could not get out. And they finally were freed, and the angels told them, go to the temple and preach right now. And the angels did that because they could not. But they told those guys to scurry off to the temple and witness because the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees and the temple guard were going, hey, we just locked these guys up. What are they doing out and preaching God in the same place where we caught them in the first place to lock them up? And it's because the angels said, go do it. The angels didn't do it themselves. It was mankind that had to witness to other mankind. Billy Graham stated this. He says that God made provision for the salvation of fallen men. Pretty good statement. Quote, unquote, God made provision for the salvation of fallen men. And Billy Graham continues. This is what's key. He made no provision for the salvation of fallen angels. Because I have not seen Lucifer be saved yet. Nor really ever will be. And why is that? It's probably perhaps like mankind, unlike mankind, uh, we're enticed towards sin by sinners. That's a typical thing that happens with mankind. We are enticed to sin by sin or sinners. But when the angels fair, fell, there were no sinners. There was nobody up in heaven to cause them to sin. So no one could entice them to sin. Therefore, the falling angel's sinful state cannot be altered. Their sin cannot be forgiven. Their salvation cannot be achieved. Our sins can be forgiven. Our salvation can be realized. We saw that in, in, when I talked about 1 John 1, 9, where it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a promise that cannot be given to the fallen angels. Given to us. We imagine angels to be very beautiful winged beings dressed in white cloaks and almost glowing with an aura of a body engulfing halo. And while that might, that might be true, I've never seen an angel face to face, but God often sends them as invisible beings or in special clothing to blend them with their surroundings as they perform their assigned duties. Some people pray to an angel or form a special relationship with an angel. Ooh. Yet the Bible